Ursus maritimus, the polar bear, okay? This particular animal is about nine foot three when measured from the nose to the tail, from the claw up over the back to the other claw, add them together and then divide by two. It's called squaring a bear. So you're actually making two measurements. You're making a measurement from here down to the tail mm -hmm. and then from here over to here and then divide by two. So it gives you kind of a, a squared off and that's why it's called squaring the bear, okay? Wow. Now, a couple interesting points. If you had to guess what color is the hide of a polar bear, people will say, well, white. Yeah. Exactly the opposite. Remember, they're trying to absorb UV radiation. Their, their skin is black. That's why if you look up around the snout, where the hair's thinner, you see how it's black? Yeah. That's to absorb, to absorb the UV radiation. So, if you're doing an insertion in the Arctic, like on a military op or something, be very, very careful when you're doing your infrared scan, because they are so well insulated, they don't give off a heat signature. And you might want to be careful where you where you hop off your uh, your helicopter at, you know, things but, to keep in mind. Well, Jake, let's pause here for a second because I was sitting with Steve Cash yesterday at Sportsman's Club, where we met last time, and he was telling about the polar bear story. While we're here, if this this is the polar bear we're talking about, right? That's good right there. What do you think? I was talking to Nancy. I'm okay. sorry. That's is good it? right there. Uh, okay, so what's the question? I'm sorry. No, the question. Well, Steve Cash is setting me up for you know, Greg. You got to ask Jake about the polar bear story, and I said sure. And this is clearly the polar bear. This is the clearly the polar. Okay. In order to really put everything in context, the first thing I have to tell you is the Faulkner High School did a refit about ten years ago, and when they did their refit, they decided they were going to replace the walk-in freezer, so they donated the pre-existing one, which was still functional, to the Faulkner Rotary. I went ahead and decided I was going to buy it, not realizing that Tim Black was on the Rotary Committee, and every time I bid, somebody was bidding me up. <laughs> and it was my buddy, Tim Black. Nonetheless, at, at $1,800, he finally bailed, and instead of getting it for $1,300, I got it for $1,800. Not that I remember, not that I'm trying to rub it <laughs> in or anything, but uh, so I, I got the freezer. We actually had it installed in the garage, got it running, and it ran between 42 and 44 degrees below zero. Okay. And what I did was every day, every day, I'd get down into my birthday suit and I'd grab a towel, a flashlight, a wooden stool, and a book. And I think sometimes I had flip-flops on, but not all the time. And I'd go in there and I'd shut the door and I made sure that part of the towel always stuck out under the door so the door couldn't shut on me. It, it couldn't latch anyways, but I, I made sure. <laughs> and I'd go in there and every day I tried to add one page now, at the time, I was reading Atlas Shrugged by Ayn Rand, okay, which is small print. And I think I probably improved my speed reading skills because, I mean, if you're sitting naked in a freezer reading Ayn Rand with a flashlight, trying to acclimate to the cold, you're trying to get through those pages as fast as you can. And I think over the four months that I was trying to acclimate, I got to where I could withstand 42 degrees below zero naked, I could get 17 pages. That was my record. My record was 17 pages. At any rate, then uh, the night before I left on my hunt, I, uh, I spent the night in the cooler on the floor, but I was dressed. In fact, funny you should mention it. In fact, this is the kind of apparel that you wear, okay? This particular thing, you can get a feel for it, go ahead and feel, okay? Get a feel for the, for the overall weight of the outfit there. Holy cow. Okay, that I mean, that, that is easily good to 40 below, easy. Now, I took what's called Northern Outfitters gear with me. That's good to 100 below. And I will tell you, the coldest weather I ever had to tolerate with wind chill was 103 below. It was 53 below, 53 degrees below zero Fahrenheit, but there was a 50 mile an hour wind. So with wind chill, I mean, we were talking triple digits. And that was, the, that was the defining moment of the hunt for me, and I'll tell you why. The Inuits, uh, the Inuits actually stopped in the middle of a, a whiteout, and uh, they turned... Where was the location? Um, I was actually on Victoria Island, uh, in the southwest part of the island called Holman. It's since been deeded back to the Inuit nation, and it's now called Uluhuktuk. That's the native name, as opposed to the English name, which was Holman, H-O-L-M-A-N. Mm -hmm. So at any rate, they went ahead and... Uh, I lost my train of thought now. What were they talking about? A whiteout. Oh, yeah. I'm in a whiteout, and uh, 
the Eskimo, the Inuits come back to me. By the way, Eskimo means eaters of raw meat. Um, so they come back to me and they said, Jake, here's the deal. We can try to pitch the tent, a canvas tent right now, to get us out of the wind. With 50 mile an hour wind, what do you think the chances are we can put a tent up? I said, not good. They said, the other thing we could probably do is just put the canvas over the side of the Kamatuk sled and just get in here and wait for the weather to break. They said, or we could try to gut, suck it up and gut it out and go about another 10 miles because there's a fishing shanty up here. And if we get to the shanty, it's made out of plywood, that would offer us the best protection. And I said, I mean, this is somebody who had been acclimating to this. I'd been jogging around the yard a couple times every night barefoot just to get used to the cold as best as I could. I said, I'm good, guys. I, I'm good. And at that moment, the one Inuit turned to the other Inuit and he went, like, this guy's game. This guy's really ready. Let's go. So we sucked it up. We hopped on the, snow, you know, we hopped on the snowmobile, which was pulling the sled that had the dogs with it which was pulling me, which had the hunter in it, and we went 10 more miles and no, of no consequence. You know, we got there and I mean, you know, our cheeks were cool and our fingers were a little bit slow to move, but we were fine. And uh, from that moment on, they had a lot more respect for me. I mean, mm -hmm. they, they really thought, this guy is serious about this and that, that's what we want. We want people that really respect our what, culture. What do you wear around your head, Jake? You can pull this thing, you can pull this thing tight. And when you do, you just have a little circle right here. Okay. You have a go you have ski yeah. goggles on and a thing called a balaclava, yeah. which comes across your face. Okay. The problem is that at that time, Jimmy Larson had just given me orthodontia. Yeah. And they have hooks on them to yeah. hold the wires. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Gotcha. When you put that balaclava on, it's pulling, your, it's pulling the skin into those hooks. And you're being pulled on a sled, which is being pulled across ice and land. So it's boom, boom, and it's bone jarring. And I'm not embellishing. I wish I'd taken a photograph of it. The inside of my mouth looked like hamburger. Yeah. I mean, I was a bloody mess. Uh, and I'll, there's a story about that. When I, when I went to a bar after the hunt was done, there's a story about that, too. So at any rate, we're, we're okay, now we've gone through all this cold weather. We, we, we've done what we needed to do. It's the seventh day of a 14-day polar bear hunt. We wake up that morning, and the weather was bad, white out. You couldn't see 100 yards. So we're staying in the tent. We're not in a big hurry to get going. We can hear the squall starting to die down. So we pop our head out a second time. And now 600 yards away, there's another tent. Come to find out, every night the Inuits go on a shortwave radio and they call back to the village and they just check in with friends and family and they let the local game warden know where they are, blah, 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 blah. And we had found some really big tracks that afternoon. So we let them know. Well, there was another guide in town uh. whose hunter had just arrived and he hears all this talk about a big bear and his guy's a gun hunter not a bow hunter like bringing a knife to a gunfight so <laughs> they moved in on us now supposedly the Inuit are a pretty peaceful group of people I've seen another side of them okay because my guide I thought my guide was gonna rip that man apart when he went over to read him the riot act about moving in on us and within 15 minutes they broke camp and went away okay and I, I saw some things I probably wasn't supposed to see. <laughs> so we go out hunting that day. And please picture, you know, that now by law you can't hunt the bear on a snowmobile. You've, got to, you've now got to be on a, on a dog pulled sled. Okay? So now the dogs are going and I'm on a sled behind them being pulled in the, and the, the Inuit is, is, is essentially not only a guide, he's a dog wrangler. Okay? And off we go. And I mean, I'm, I'm hearing, I'm hearing the, the sound, you know, the call of the wild from, from a Jack London book or something <laughs> in the back of my head. And we're going along and we're going along. And after about maybe five or six miles, maybe 45 minutes, you can see a line in the snow. And you know what it is. It's tracks. We get up to them and they're bear tracks and they're fresh. And you can tell a fresh bear track because the snow around the edges of the track hasn't fallen back in yet. So these tracks are smoking fresh because it had been windy all night. It blew, it wiped the slate clean. Any tracks you see now are since the snow and the wind stopped. Plus, you know, the dogs are just going bananas because they know, they know it's a fresh, a fresh track, they can smell it. And they also know if you kill it, they get fresh, warm, bloody meat. So the dogs are by far your best friend. We get up to it and the rule of thumb is this. You measure the width of a bear track Say, say those are eight inches wide, you measure the width of a front foot and you add one. Those tracks are about eight inches wide. Add one, that's a nine foot bear. The double check is to look at the pad of the back foot without the toes. 
just the main the main pad, like your, the sole of your foot without the toes. Just measure the pad, the, the length of the back pad. It's nine feet long. It's nine inches. Okay. You don't add one to the back foot. You only add one to the front foot. So an eight inch wide front track is a nine foot bear. A nine inch back pad is a nine foot bear. Mine was eight on the front, nine on the back. So you've got a double check. And we thought, my gosh, we're looking at a nine foot polar bear. For me, that's a shooter. They, they've killed 10 and 11 footers. And my approach was any mature animal is gonna be a trophy for Jake. And I said, let's go, man. So he turns the dogs, and they're, they're, we're literally running right down the tracks of the bear now. And after about 20 minutes, I hear the guide, and, he's, and his name was uh, Walter Oliffy, but his Inuit name was Ulik. And he's jabbering in Inuit, and the last word he says is Nanuk, or Nanuk, which is polar bear. So, I mean, he's only about five foot four, and I'm, you know, significantly taller than him, and I'm... I look around him, and all I can see up ahead of us is an igloo. I go, what on earth is an igloo doing up here? It wasn't an igloo. It was the curve of his ass on the ice. Wow. Okay? I mean, that, <coughs> he looked so big as we were approaching him. What I thought was an igloo was the curve of his backside. You know, and now, now the dogs have seen him. And now it's like lunch. So he immediately reaches up and un unleashes two dogs. Okay? Now, the year, I'd hunted two years in a row. The year before I hunted polar bear, and I was unsuccessful. That year, they had some kind of an illness, like distemper or something, come through the Inuit community, and it killed 60% of the dogs, including his two best bear dogs. The definition of a bear dog is a dog that's fearless. You let them go, they'll go right up to the bear, and they'll get right in his face. They'll, they'll come around behind him, and they'll nip at his ass. You know, and I mean, they, they're all teeth and they're very intimidating and they keep the bear focused on them so you can put a stalk on them and get close enough to kill them. Mm -hmm. Well, they're dead. So the following year, he borrowed a couple of dogs from his brother. These were by no means as aggressive. And sure enough, I mean, I'm trying to get my bow out of the, out of the case now. And when I pull the bow out and go to put the quiver in, and re please understand, I've been shooting every day. Everything was working fine. All systems are go. It's used, everything's acclimated to the cold. The day that the polar bear was first seen, I go to put the quiver into the bow, and my quiver split in half. <laughs> so strike one. So now I have to hold the quiver in my hand while I'm holding the bow. All right, fine. And I'm bouncing along in the back of the camera tuck, you know, I'm getting ready to hop off. <sighs> and I go to put the release. Um, you strap a release on your hand and then you click it on your bowstring. So when you pull it back, you just touch a little trigger and it lets go of the string. Because if you shoot with your fingers, and I mentioned this the other day when we were at uh, uh, Den Adelsman. As you pull the string back, the string has a tendency to, to, to torque, to spin. And when you pull it back and then you let go of it, it reverse spins, which can kick the knock of the arrow to the left, which makes your arrow go to the right, or vice versa, depending on whether you're left or right-handed. So at any rate, I'm shooting a release, and I go to pull it back, the release is frozen shut. Okay, I don't know if it touched my hand, got some oil or something on it or whatever, but it froze shut. I had probably shot 10,000 arrows in preparation for this hunt but none of them I'd shot instinctive. I was shooting with a release every time. I thought, oh my God, my release isn't working. I gotta shoot instinctive. And I thought, wait a minute, wait a minute, maybe I can get it open. So I'm trying to get it open like this. Remember, there's saliva in your mouth, okay? And sure enough, the damn release clicked on my orthodontia. <laughs> okay, so what do you do? You got, a, you got a 1,300 pound carnivore 20 yards away with two dogs that aren't doing a very good job at keeping his attention. So he's starting to look around. You say, well, forget about the release. So, so I, I ripped it out of my mouth. There's a wire that holds all of those clips together. And Jimmy would turn that wire to, you know, well, I pulled the wire out. And when the wire came out, it came out of my lip like this. And it went right through the lower part of my lip. I didn't feel it. I didn't know it at the time because it just barely caught the lip. Every time I'd go to pull a string back, the wire would go doing. And every time I'd let go of an arrow, it'd go doing. And I shot the bear seven times, okay? By the time I got done, I had a little bit of a hole in my lip, plus all the inside of my mouth is Hamburg from the orthodontia, okay? <laughs> Just Murphy's Law. I mean, the, Murphy's on the ground soiling himself while this is all happening. So at any rate, I, take, um, I, I pull the string back. I don't have a release. I know my sights aren't going to be right. I've got this gargantuan hat on my head, which is real thick. 
when you pull that string back, you have to get what's called an anchor point. Okay? The problem is the string is on the outside of the hat, which is keeping my hand away from my head. Okay? That's going to make me shoot to the left because I'm right hand. I, I'm left handed, but I shoot a bow and arrow right handed because I'm right eye dominant. So I pull it back and I can't get the string against my head, really. It's kind of out here. So I'm thinking, okay, I've got to aim to the right because I'm going to shoot to the left. So the, the bear's now running. The dogs haven't baited him up. They're not keeping him still. He's trying to run to get to the 20 foot high sea ice, which is a big, gnarly, jumbled up bunch of ice. So I'm swinging through. The bear's running. The guide's screaming, just get an arrow in him. And I'm, I go ahead and I shoot. And I didn't lead him enough. Okay? And the arrow hit him. Uh, the arrow hit him about here uh, on the other side yeah hit him over here okay and he roars turns around bites the arrow keeps on running so i grab a second arrow and i draw and i lead him a little bit more and i shoot now he's further away and i it was a renal hit i hit him in the kidney i didn't i, w I was a little bit higher but i still hadn't led him enough and he's further away i needed to lead him more and he he turns around and bites the arrow off and he keeps on running well, now the guide is trying to get the dogs and the sled ahead of the bear. So I thought, well, I gotta hop on. I go to hop on and I lose my balance. And I fall off, he doesn't know it. So now he's got the gun. So now he goes several hundred yards ahead of me, gets ahead of the bear. And the bear's looking at all these dogs, you know, and the dogs that are nipping at him in this sled and this big guy on the sled and everything, and they're going, He's thinking, well, I don't want any part of that. So he turns around to come back the way that he'd run already, which is exactly where I'm standing. I'm standing in his tracks. Okay? So here he comes, and he's coming right back at me, and the guide and the gun and the bears are on the wrong side of the bear now. And I thought, this is not good. So I went ahead and I took some, uh, I took off my hat because it was brown. I took off the hat and put it down in, inside of this. Now the inner shell that I have over me, the anorak, is white. So I pull that up over me, and I'm white from here all the way down to my feet, which are great big honking black arctic boots, and it looks just like a seal head, which is what they feed on. So as quickly as I could, because the bear was still focused on the, on the Inuit, I'm covering up my boots with white, covering up my boots with snow, okay? And I've got the, and the bow has got white duct tape on it, okay? So I'm just kind of standing there. And I got an arrow on it, and I thought, you know what? If he's coming at me, the only chance I've got is to hit him in the spine. If I hit him in the spine, he will drop in front of me. And I thought, but I'm, I'm, I'm not, my left and right's not good because of my anchor point. And I thought, if I can't the bow like a crossbow, then I'm looking down the, the x-axis instead of the y-axis. Maybe I've got a better chance of hitting him. The problem is he's so tall, I've got to let him get to about three and a half or four yards before I can take the shot. So I'm only going to get one chance at this. So I can't the bow, and I'm at full draw, and he's coming, and he's coming, and he's coming. And I thought, i got to hold the bow. I can't move now, because if he sees me, he's got me. So I'm just holding it, and I'm about like this, and I'm waiting for him to get right there. And I don't know what happened, but at seven yards, he veered to his right, my left. And as he veered, and remember, this bow I shoot will kill an elephant. It's a 110-pound draw. And I swing through, and I shoot, and it hit him right in the ear. Now, please understand, he's seven yards away, getting shot with, an, with a bow that'll kill an elephant, his head didn't even move. It didn't even go, nothing, you know? I mean, I, there's maybe that much arrow sticking in him. And, and off he goes with an arrow hanging out of his head. And I thought, oh my God, what, what else can go wrong? And now he gets into what we call the sea ice. I mean, it's slabs of ice as big as this room. The ice is extremely sharp edged. If you fall, it, I mean, it, it could almost sever an arm. It'll easily break a bone. And I thought, Jake, you got to be careful, buddy. I mean, if the bear doesn't get you, the ice could. So now, you know, he's gone up into the ice, and he's leaving a blood trail that Helen Keller could follow. You know, and I've got a bow in one hand trying to hold the quiver because the quiver is broken. So I'm holding the quiver and the bow in this hand, and I'm trying to climb through the sea ice to follow the blood trail. And I look up on top of the ice, and here's, the, here's an arrow. And I thought, it's the arrow out of his head. And I know it's not in him anymore because I can see it's stuck in the snow. I thought, I gotta get that arrow back. You know, I've only got, you know, a couple, a few more in my quiver. I thought, I gotta, I gotta go up there and get that arrow. And I thought, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. The wind is wrong. Right now, the wind is wrong. I need to go around the ice and come at it from this side so that I can make sure of where the bear is. Sure enough, I slide back down the ice, go, to, go, to, go around the ice pile, and here's the bear laying behind the arrow with his paw out, just like when they hunt seals. 
If I'd have gone up there to get that arrow, he'd have had me. I wouldn't have even been close. I wouldn't have been able to maneuver. So at any rate, you know, once I get around him, now I'm upwind of him. <coughs> He's downwind of me. He smells me. Okay, and he and he sees me, and he drops down off the ice, and now he's he's boogering. He's not he's not coming at me. He's good, trying to get away from me. So now I go up on top, and I I grab the arrow, put it back in the quiver, and I'm slipping and sliding and swearing like a sailor, getting back down on the ice, and now I'm trying to catch up with him again, and he kind of gone around this little island of ice. I I put an arrow in the quiver, or I put an arrow on the string, and I go to shoot and the arrow is perfect. It's going to hit him on the other side. It's going to hit him right there. That's the top of his heart and, both, and it will go through both of his lungs, the double pneumothorax. And it's going to hit him right there. And as he's running, just as the arrow's ready to hit him, this elbow and leg comes back and the arrow hit him right on the elbow instead of, you know, killing him. And he turns around. I mean, I'll, I'll, give, you, I'll give you an example. Okay. Okay. Those every one of those arrows has polar bear blood on it. Those are the seven arrows that hit him. Okay. Now, now there's something else I need to show you though. That's called a mechanical broadhead. This is called a cut on contact. I was trying to use both types of arrows on him. Those are not as affected by wind. These can wind plane, but they're far, far stronger. My first couple arrows were using that type of broadhead, and they did not work well. These worked great, but the wind had a tendency to blow them, and you'd miss your, your intended point of impact, okay? So at any rate, the fourth, arrow, the fourth arrow hits him, and these are fairly stiff arrows. He turns around, and just, just, he just kind of goes, ah, and this thing would just splintered. It just splintered. I thought, can you imagine the force in this guy's jaws? I thought, I don't want to know firsthand. So off he, off he goes. And uh, so now I've shot at him. I've shot at him four times. I've hit him in the left hand, and the arrow's gone up into his vitals. I've hit him in the kidneys. I've hit him in the head, and I've hit him on the elbow. Although it should have been a perfect shot, but he was running. Uh, I, I keep trying, and he's starting to slow down a little bit. I'm trying to get up to him. I've got another arrow on the string, and it, he's about 48 yards away, and I'm lethal out to probably at least 70. I draw and shoot, you know, instinctive, and I, and I whiffed. I mean, I could see the arrow skipping across the ice, and it's several hundred yards behind him. I thought, well, that arrow's gone. And, uh, and then uh, he comes up to this crack in the ice. Now, you have to understand the way the ice freezes in the Arctic. When these, two she when these plates of ice come together sometimes, what will happen is one will subduct. One will go down, one will go up, and they, and they can make real high mounds of ice. Other times when they hit, what will happen is they'll, they'll make like little splinters, like the San Andreas Fault. And what will happen is the ice will form a little V, and that will fill up with water. And since it's a small localized bunch of water, it freezes faster. And that's what happened. He found one of these little crevices that was probably maybe four foot wide, and it had, it had V like this filled up with water, and then it froze on top. And he broke through that top ice and got down in that, because now he's standing on ice again walking through water with ice on top of it. And he's turning all the water in that little V, pink. I mean, it's, it's his blood. So he starts walking down the crack under ice. And I can see him. It's like a great big snowball walking. And I've got an arrow on my string, and I'm like walking down like this, and I'm walking down like this, and I can see him. I thought, he can wash out the sea. I may never get him. <laughs> and all of a sudden, I look up ahead, and I can see that the V narrows. It's going to pinch out. So I run up ahead of him, and I turn around, and I'm standing like this, waiting for him to break through the ice to get a breath of air. And sure enough, he does. He hits it with his head, and the ice is about that thick. You ever try to break two-inch ice? I mean, you know, you got to be Hercules. And he broke it like that. Hits it with his head, and as he comes up, they have a valve in their nose, you know, and it, it opens up, and he takes a breath of air. And I'm standing, I'm, I'm from here to there. And I'm standing there like this, and he comes up, and he, he, he takes a breath of air, and he turns around, and he looks at me, and his eyeballs just go like that, and I shot. And the arrow hit him right here, then it went right down through him and, and exited out by his, just after this liver. He turns around, he, he goes right back down in the hole, and how he did it, I don't know, but he turned, that thing turned around in a crack of ice about that wide. Turned around and went right back the way he came. He gets back to the original hole that he entered the ice in, and he gets out of the ice. Now, I've shot at this bear six times. I have a six arrow quiver. 
but I have that one arrow that I went and got, so I'm down to my last arrow. He gets out on the ice, and he turns around, and he looks at me, and he lays his ears back. When any animal in the wild is going to attack, they always lay their ears back, because if their ears are sticking up, it's too easy for a claw or something to rip their ears off. They lay their ears back to preserve them. I thought, oh man, here it comes, here it comes. So I, I've got my last arrow on, I thought, here it comes, and he starts, he takes one step toward me, and he takes a st second step toward me, and the ears are laid back, and it collapsed right there. And I ran up to him and shot him right, uh, double new orthorax again, and he's still there for five more minutes. And then the Eskimo finally caught up with me, the dog wrangler finally caught up with us. They, uh, they had to help me put my gloves back on. I'd had my gloves off for 35 minutes and eight of my 10 fingers were so badly frostbit that I couldn't use them. Um, we had to get the bear turned over because he was starting to freeze right in front of our eyes. I only got a couple rather mediocre photographs before we started skinning him. And in the process, I lost my footing and the bear flopped over on me. Dead. Now this bear is stone cold dead. I've got 240 pounds soaking wet Inuits trying to help me get that bear off of me. And it was all we could do to get me out from underneath the bear. I was so tired and sweaty and scared and pooped and everything. They finally got me out from underneath the bear and I thought if he had even been a quarter alive, I wouldn't have had a prayer. I wouldn't have had a prayer. So at any rate, that, that's my polar bear. Um, you know, seven air, I, a six arrow quiver shot, shot at him seven times, got back to civilization about three days later, walked into a bar in Yellowknife, and it's called something like the Black Angus Pub, or the Black Angus Irish <coughs> Pub, or something like that. And I walked in, and I ordered six Crown Royal and seven ups, and they're Burger Blaster, or whatever it was called. The burger's like this big. So they said, well, where's your party going to be sitting? I said, he's right here at the bar. <laughs> so they put six of them up, and I drank four of them immediately to numb my mouth. Strictly for medicinal purposes. Yeah, of course. Okay, I had four of them. In three minutes, I drank four of the drinks. Now I'm numb. Ate the burger, drank the last two drinks, and staggered back to the hotel and passed out on the bed. <laughs> <laughs> that's my polar bear. Huh? Unbelievable. So... Now, when you go on these hunts, Jake, are you, are you by yourself? Are there other hunters in your party? It, can, it varies. Some of them are what they call DIY, do it yourself. Others are guided hunts. An American cannot hunt polar bear, do it yourself. It's against the law. You are required by law to have a guide. So on that particular hunt, I had a guide. Any Canadian hunt other than uh, Canadian moose, any American that goes has to go guided. Okay unless you marry a Canadian. Hey. Unfortunately, my bride was not Canadian. If I had married into a family, then I could have gone do it yourself in Canada. And I know a guy that actually did that. Dennis Dunn actually married a Canadian so he could hunt Canada without having to go guide it. But it, to me, it's not a big deal. You know, it's kind of helpful to have a, a gun around sometimes, you know? So I, I have no problem with that. So what year again was this, uh, the hunt? This was, two, uh, this was uh, March of 2007. Okay. 